To have faith in God is not a stagnant state, it's a journey. As believers, we should grow in our knowledge of God and His Word. Walk with Alan Cutting and many other believers as we walk the believer's journey. Aloha, and thank you again for joining us on the believer's journey. I want to let you know that we're so grateful for all that you do and the way you support us. Uh, those of you who watch our program, obviously, those who share our program, and all of you who are subscribed to our program, we really do appreciate that. I also want to appreciate and tell, give my thanks to those uh, sponsors. We have Guerrero CPA, Guerrero Law, and Trade Show Displays, and pretty soon I think there's going to be a church that also is going to start supporting us, which is really nice. And um, I want to just thank everyone for your prayers it's really important that uh, you continue to pray for us. I have noticed that we're reaching into countries we didn't, haven't reached in a long time. For example, I've noticed Russia and also uh, Ukraine is, is back up there and, and watching our program again. I guess a lot of the, the war is subsiding in certain areas that they're able to get the internet on. So it's just really a blessing. Um, today is one of my favorite, if not the favorite shows we do. It's a... Uh, it's questions on the fly, Bible questions on the fly, and we're on number 21 at this point. And I have with me my favorite moderator, Angela Montez. Hi, how are you? Angela Montez. And she is uh, becoming a uh, world traveler. <laughs> so anyway, say hello, Angela, and tell us about your trip a little uh -huh. bit. No, well, hi. Um, I went to Bali for three weeks in, in Indonesia and went to Flores Island as well and did a lot of hiking and um, snorkeling and scuba diving and met some really incredible people throughout the journey. Um, ate some great food. But I was telling Al, like, a, after a week and a half, I don't want any more rice or noodles. Um, <laughs> it was fantastic. It's the longest vacation I took and it was special because I turned 50 this year. And my best friend turns 50 in a couple of weeks. And so we did this together. Um, we're kind of just celebrating our 50th year. And, and it was great. It was really interesting just to see the culture and um, just how people live and and how sometimes those with so little are so happy, right? And we have so much. And just to yeah. make me a lot more <clears throat> grateful of where I'm at and to, I don't know, to, to live life, right? Yeah. So, yeah, it was great. That's so cool. I love traveling. It's just one of the things I've always loved doing in my life. I do too. I've got uh, my girls graduate from college in May, so I can finally get into that point where I can start to like do things like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, and then for the next uh, six weeks or so, we'll be um, broadcasting out of uh, Moldova and Slovenia and I think Italy. So we'll be, we'll be gone for a while. We'll be still broadcasting. It'll be kind of interesting. Our, the first uh, missionaries that we'll be interviewing is in Slovenia, and you'll love them. They're just really uh, pleasant people, and so we'll be doing that uh, from Slovenia. And so anyway, let's get on with our program, and go ahead. It's all yours. Great. Thank you, Alan. Uh, so I'm going to take this first question. It's from the United States. And um, it's just, it just it's a hard question, but you do great with the hard questions. <laughs> so unlike other Christian podcasters and video programs, I noticed that you do not address any social issues like LGBTQ, gay marriage, abortion, or gun violence. Why not? And shouldn't we get your view on such issues? You know, it's interesting. So just so you know where I am at with my calling from God as a Bible teacher, it's really to teach the word. And it's really important to me that I teach the believers in Jesus how to live as, as a believer, uh, what the scriptures say that we need to do so that we can have eternal life with him. And that's really the basis of where I come from. Then as far as you know, some people say, oh, you're a teacher. Well, I'm a teacher of the word. I'm not like a math teacher and I'm not an English teacher. And um, But it's really important to understand that I, t I teach the word. And God has done some amazing things that I totally blown away with what comes out of my mouth sometimes. I'll watch a program that I go back to and it's like, I said that? <laughs> I don't even remember certain things. And so it's really amazing. But 
to answer the question, I know that I watch other podcasters also. I like to see what they're doing. I want to see, you know, the topics, what they say, what they believe. And I know there's a few out there that I really like. And they normally have hot topics. You know, they'll talk about the gay movement or they'll talk about these different things. And I notice that their viewership is like 500,000 or 250,000, even a million, um, believe it or not. But I'm not there. It's not, I'm not trying to get people to watch the programs, you know, so I get a whole lot of people and possibly make money by selling products or whatever it might be. It's purely by teaching the word. Um, it's a ministry, pure ministry. And so even when I go to different churches and they call me to a church, you know, I don't even ask for money. I mean, it's like I'm there to teach. If you want to give me a uh, love offering, great. Just take care of my uh, expenses to get there and I'm good, you know. So it's, it's not about the income. We have an income, so I don't worry about that. We're like a tent maker, uh, Susan and I. So we, we do this ministry because God's called us to do this. And so when we go to Moldova, we pay our own way mostly. We do have sometimes uh, a church will help us with going over there or taking items there like clothing or vitamins. We just don't do that uh, to depend on other people. We do depend on the Lord for this. And so it's really important that we understand that. So when I teach, I'm trying to teach what the Bible teaches us how to live. Mm -hmm. The Bible teaches us that we need to become holy. I mean, it says that in the Old Testament several times. Peter says it in the New Testament. Paul says in, in um, Ephesians 5 that we need to be imitators of God. So it really talks a lot about becoming like him. Jesus said, you know, that we need to eat his flesh and drink his blood or we won't have everlasting life. He's talking about becoming like him. You're making him Lord of their life. And so in that respect, I teach that. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to topics, now we have had topics about abortion on our program because we've had uh, centers, like pregnancy centers come in, or we've had a, a couple that have come in and talked about abortion and things like that. So I do talk about that because I do believe that the Bible speak, speaks about thou shalt not murder and also is very strong about how God teaches how we need to protect the innocent. And that's real prevalent in the scripture. Um, he's, he's very strong in the teaching of protecting and taking care of the innocent people, you know, and I think that's really important. As far as the other issues, I mean, if they come up, they come up, but it's, it's not because I want to get a bunch of viewers or make more money because people are gonna click on stuff. It's just because it's part of the topic that I'm teaching that brings us to the way we need to live and walk with Jesus. So I'm not like a lot of other podcasters because I, I just, I'm not in it for that. I'm in it because I want to honor Jesus, period. There's no other reason. There's no other income that's drawn from this. I mean, basically I have to find income to pay for this. <laughs> so it's all about that. And um, though these other podcasters, I mean, they're, some of them are really good. Ruslan, I, I love him. I think he's amazing, you know, but there's some out there that's all they do is get on these topics and they push it and hit it. And it's almost like they're, they're not, that, that's their motive rather than bringing them to a very understanding of how we need to, to live rather than how not to live. And I think they're talking about how not to live and I'm talking about how to live. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's the big difference, but I hope that answered the question. Yeah, I think you did a great job on answering the question. I think, you know, just in general public, we look for, you know, um, what does the Bible say about this, right? And, and it's hard because the Bible tells us how to live, but doesn't cover all the changes that happens within the culture, like what, what's going on. But so you can deviate into like opinion versus maybe what, what the Bible is stating. So right. I appreciate that. And, and it's interesting because when I go to Moldova, so Susan and I, we basically pay our own way there. And we basically, there are missionaries that put us up. So we have, we're taken care of. Most of our food is taken care of. It's all really basically there. But when we go into churches and we go into other uh, s centers and we teach to groups, Christian groups or churches and stuff like that, missionaries, uh, groups of missionaries, 
we do it because we want to spread the word. We want to teach the word so that they will be stronger, so they can build a community of the church in their area mm -hmm. to live for Jesus. One of the things that I have started to do a few years ago or several years ago is teach on uh, romantic relationships. You know, that was asked to do that. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, and they talked me into it. And so I put together this r romantic relationship thing, you know, about couples. And and uh, I kind of follow the thinking of Gary Smalley. A lot of people may not know who he is, but I, I follow his ideas and his thinking. And so I started to do that. And I did one on intimacy versus sex one time and it was very hilarious and so i'm because i'm a comedian kind of person you know i'm always telling jokes and so my wife even told me some pictures i was using no you can't use that you know <laughs> <laughs> so i'm told what i can't do sometimes yeah. but the thing is is that one time while i was there doing a seminar of this manner there was a missionary who contacted a person here in the United States who does those kind of things. He talks about the women's brain and the men's brain. He goes mm -hmm. back and forth. And he contacted them and asked them, how much would it cost to have him come over? Well, after wanting the first class airfare tickets and five star hotel stay and car rentals and, you know, for five people and all this, this and that and salary of 25,000, it was $50,000 mm -hmm. that they wanted. I'm like, and, and the missionary's like, we're one of the poorest countries in the world. <laughs> I mean, are they serious? Yeah. I says, well, it's not about ministry for them. That's their bread and butter, mm -hmm. you know. And so really, to me, it's about the ministry. And God will provide, I think, as I honor him. And so I don't think about the other stuff. Mm -hmm. So Good. We're glad you do what you do, Alan. Yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, so the next question uh, that I wanted to get into is, uh, this is from Pakistan. What consequences did the sin of Adam and Eve bring to all mankind? <clears throat> okay, so this has been asked several different ways. Um, the thing is, when God created Adam and Eve, he created them holy. He created them innocent, and he created them with, uh, you know, wonder and beauty and all these things, and they're in the garden, and you can see that in, in the creation story. What happened when they sinned? Well, let me go back a little bit. One of the things that God did that I think a lot of Christians, a lot of pastors, a lot of teachers overlook. God gave mankind dominion over the earth and everything on the earth. That's huge. What God said was, you're now sovereignty over the earth. He basically gave it to us. And so God let go of that for our sake. So we would do that and take care of what he gave us. What Adam and Eve did was they went and sinned against God by doing the very thing God asked them not to do. And what they did was they handed over our dominion, our hold, if you will, over to Lucifer. Mm -hmm. So in our sin, what we've done is we've turned over our rights, our stronghold of taking care of the earth. And now it's called the world Satan certain the world of Satan you know he is the king of ruler of the world because we handed it to them and what that sin did to us was it broke relationship or fellowship with God now what I mean in that respect is that he it broke our eternal life with him so yes we live on earth God said if you eat of this tree you'll surely die. Now, obviously, they ate and they were still alive and lived for several years. But we're talking about physical, not a physical death at that point. They did die eventually. And I have a feeling God's plan was for them to live eternally at that point. Mm -hmm. But they chose death and they died eventually. And now we die. And now that's entered sickness into the world. You know, a lot of transgressions, a lot of stuff. Um, a lot of sin is entered into the world, like murder and lying and cheating and all these things have come from that. And because of that, it's taken away all that God created in us that, to be like him. And now we're, we're tainted. The, the way he created us in his image is now, it's all corrupted. That being holy is no longer holy. That being love is no longer love. We have an idea of love. And even yours and my idea of love are going to be different because they're not going to be God's love. Mm -hmm. It's different now. It's changed because of that sin. 
and that has separated us from God. And so the only way to be part of him is to turn back to him and follow him. And um, if you look at the world today, very few want to do that. So that's what the sin in the garden they did for us or to us. Okay. Um, so we talked a little bit about like when you're talking about the, the topics and then talking about sin, uh, is there any false Bibles or as there are there false prophets today? Well, yeah, there's <clears throat> the book. The word Bible literally means book. Mm -hmm. So we say the Holy Bible, we're saying the Holy Book or the book. So we want to understand uh, the Bible is just a word from, I think it's a Latin, bring it into the English. And so when we say Bible, when we look at the scriptures, okay, um, the way the scriptures were written in the Hebrew um, are not exactly the way we see them today in our English Bibles or probably any other version, okay? And, and there, there are a couple reasons for that. Number one, because when based 250 to 300 BC, the Jews decided to take out the words, the letters of, of God's name. So what we have are the letters, you know, Y-H-W-H, you know, and we don't have any idea what the letters are that go in between these, these uh, consonants. Mm -hmm. what, what are the vowels? And they've destroyed all the original writings. So we don't even have original writings on earth today. Just, they're just gone. Mm -hmm. And so everything that's been translated is translated from that to that name, okay? Then we have the problem of, well, we have actually the, the Greek, um, uh, can't think of the word, uh, Septuagint, where we get all of our translations. Well, in 1008 AD, there's a translation from the Hebrew that came out called the Masoretic Text. All of our Bibles are translated from the Masoretic Text in the Old Testament, there are mistakes in the Masoretic text. I mean, major mistakes. Interesting. So, um, like, we all think that the Israelites were in, um, in Egypt under slavery for 430 years. Well, that's impossible, and it's not right, but that's what our Old Testament says. When you look mm -hmm. at Exodus, it says 430. Well, no, the time from Abraham to the time that they left to, for Moses leaving the law was 430, but it doesn't say that. So there's a mistake in there that's done, and there's proof that that's a mistake. And, and also mathematically, if you take the time they went into uh, Egypt, let's say um, Jacob went into Egypt with his clan, mm -hmm. and the time that uh, Joseph was there, okay, there's a time where Jacob came to Joseph and so forth, was only so many years. In the time of, of uh, Moses, that's 215 years. The time of the beginning to the end here of the time frame itself that they were there was only, you know, 350 years. You can do that mathematically by taking the lives and the years of who was born and how long they were there and work it out. Mm -hmm. So really, there's mistakes. That doesn't make it false. It just means in translation, we have a problem. Okay. Now, Bibles, I know this is taking too long to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Bible, Bibles today in translations, there are good translations and there are poor translations. There are translations that we think are translations that all oh, they are paraphrases. Mm -hmm. What a paraphrase is, like, the, um, I'm not sure if the message is a paraphrase, but for example, um, the Living Bible is a paraphrase. And what that means is somebody took the Bible that they have in English, it was actually done in English, and they took it and they paraphrased a, a scripture on basically what they thought it meant. Mm -hmm. And they took that scripture, put it there, and the reason it was paraphrased, that living Bible, was so that gra that person who did it, so their grandchild could understand. Interesting. So it was really a paraphrase of the scriptures, not translated. But we have a lot of those uh, paraphrases out there that aren't really translated Bibles. Now we have Bibles and they come from two different sources of translation. You have a more, more of a liberal source and more of a conservative source. Your King James, New King James, New American Standard, Revised Version, those are all pretty um, conservative. And I would say they're the better translations and more accurate. 
uh, when you have something like uh, NIV, uh, New Living Translation is a bad translation. It almost mixes paraphrase with translation. It, it's really weird. Um, I don't recommend it at all. But there, you know, NIV, there's some other ones like that that are a little more, take liberties, you know. But they're good, to, they're good to bring about. Now, when you call Bibles like the Joseph Smith Bible, okay, Joseph Smith, we know, was the founder of Mormonism mm -hmm. or the Church of Latter-day Saints. He actually wrote and translated or written, wrote a Bible. It's terrible. It is false. It is so bad. You look at a, like, um, a verse in, in Isaiah. There's one thing where it has like, the verse might be eight words in the verse. And he's got two pages of that verse. You know he's put his own words in there and he's, he calls it a translated Bible. It's false. It's a false Bible. It's terrible. I wouldn't call the Mormon Bible, the Book of Mormon, a Bible, but you know, as we look at it, because it's it's a story of a lot of different things. Same thing with a Pearl of Great Price. Now, when you look at uh, the World um, Jehovah Witness Bible, okay, New World Translation, um, that's bad. And I would say that's a false Bible. The, there's a lot of mistakes in it. And these are grammatical mistakes, periods where they don't belong. <laughs> I mm -hmm. mean, things that are just really bad. And uh, they've added stuff to it, and it's just really bad. So I would say there are false Bibles out there. You just need to really be careful. Um, I personally use a New King James Version. Uh, and, and, and to clarify that, a lot of people think that our Bibles are translated from word, from the original to word, to our, and it's not true. Yeah. You can't take uh, words from the, from the Greek, for example. Let's say I'm, I'm, I'm big on pistuo, okay? That's the word we translate into believe. But the word believe, and I've said this many times on my program, it, it's, it's a, a passive verb, and it means something we understand to be true, okay? But pisuo is an active verb. So what they've done is they've translated it to a word here in the English that kind of is like almost the same, but not really because it doesn't really relate the same, but we can make it that way. And... The word pistuo is an action that we take to follow, to continually do, continually follow, where believe doesn't do that at all. So the pistuo part of the word believe is very different in the scripture than what we have in our English. So what's really important is you take your English, take that word believe, look at the original language, and come up with, oh, this is what they really mean. This is the word they use. Even though word to word doesn't work, because they can't write a whole sentence for every word that is not word to word. And if you understand different languages, you know, it's just that way. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and as far as false prophets, uh, he said, yeah, there, there's obviously false prophets. And there's a lot of false preachers, teachers, prophets, all kinds of them that are false. But I'd be careful with our Bibles and understand that the scripture, you know, if you read the Bible cor correctly, mm -hmm. there, there are no contradictions in it. Yes, you'll find a contradiction, like I said in the beginning of that 430 years. But if you go to the actual original writings and you look that up, there's no contradiction. It's not in the Bible itself written. It's in our translation problems. Mm -hmm. So I hope, I don't know if that answers the question. I think it, it does. It does. And then I'm smiling because just on a, another note, it's not even related to that, was that you brought up Exodus. And I have, this is probably the fourth or fifth time this week that that specific part of Exodus has popped up. I guess I do a Bible study called Bible Recap with a friend of mine, and and it, that's been popping up. And then my daughter and I just talked about it last night, and we talked about um, why a question came up: like, why did God have to harden the hearts, harden Pharaoh's heart? And so my daughter and I are talking about that, and I said, it's you know, from my understanding, is that he had to harden his heart because the Israelites were comfortable, even though they were in slavery in that time. They that's what they knew, and they were comfortable there. He hadn't hardened Pharaoh's heart. It would have been harder for the Israelites to leave. So it was that, that was my understanding. This was totally out of question on here, but it was just no, my understanding good. of that. And what's really interesting about this, because somebody actually brought me that same question, yeah. and uh, just recently, the thing about God hardening Pharaoh's heart. If you read the story, okay, mm -hmm. when Moses goes to Pharaoh and he does his, you know, thing. It's Pharaoh that hardens his own heart. Mm, yeah. 
and then God gives him the first plague. Mm -hmm. And then Moses comes back to him and talks to him again. And Pharaoh hardened his own heart again. God didn't do this. Pharaoh hardened his heart. It's after he hardened his heart that God completed that mm -hmm. hardening. So it wasn't like God just did it so he had no choice. He right. already made his choices before and hardened his own heart before God even took place in hardening. Yeah, we just talked about like that sometimes those things, situations happen because we wonder why. Why did this? And it's like, well, if God hadn't moved in this way, would you have stepped into the unknown? Yeah. Where he's wanting you to step into. Yeah. And, and you know, that's a good point. I, I think, you know, they're in a time where, you know, they're in oppression. They're in a really bad situation. And Pharaoh had it great. He had a bunch of slaves, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. He had a thousand, millions of slaves, you know, doing their own thing. And they're like, what are we going to do if they leave, you know. And, and that's the way the United States was when they first created this, the country and they put us, the Constitution. In fact, Thomas Jefferson was against slavery. But he said, how will we survive if we don't have them? But he was against them. And it's really interesting because that's all they knew. Yeah. You know, and so it, it's, it, it, is, it changes the dynamics. I mean, you know, when, when you have slaves, the country lives more on the fat of the land because they don't have to have a lot of payment for things. Once we don't have the slaves, we have to do the work ourselves, pay people, and we more income comes out of that. So it would cost us more to live. I mean, it's really interesting how that works, you know, and... Uh, but yeah, Pharaoh, Pharaoh did his own deal to himself before God decided to say, you know what, I got to have my people go out and you've already, you've already turned me off. Yeah. Yeah. And then they stepped into the unknown into what God had promised them. Right. You know? Yeah. That's kind of, that's where my daughter was talking about that with her situations. Like this had to happen in order for you to step out. And then he's been, God's been fruitful with you since then and will continue to do so as you believe and stay close to him yeah and that's really true I, I think you know i tell people this all the time if you're faithful to him he'll bless you mm -hmm. I, I think people forget that you know if you're faithful to god god will bless you and people ask me all the time well why isn't god blessing my business why isn't he blessing this and i go well first off you're not even faithful to him don't ask god to do you a bunch of favors when you don't want to live for him per totally yeah, that was in our Bible study. Oh, we're totally off the questions, but yeah. <laughs> it goes with it. So uh, my Bible study on, well, we were Thursdays, and now we switched to Mondays. And um, it started in my home almost five years ago with a group of women, with Marisa and uh, a few other women that I knew, um, <clears throat> Yvette. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we meet every week, and um, we've been doing Max Lucado's book, one of them. And that whole thing came up about just the... Um, and I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> it came up this week. Uh, oh, about ha uh, about God. And um, there are th like three really kind of different types. Sometimes we lean towards its false piece and it's the genie in the bottle. And we only call him when we need him and then we put him back in the bottle. Right. And then there's yeah. the grandfather, which Marisa and I, we weren't quite sure. It's like the sweet, loving kind. But then we need him. He's asleep and not there. So we didn't quite understand that piece of it. Um, and then the third was, oh my gosh, I forget. Oh, it's like um, the appearance. So you're only, there's a God only on Sunday, but Monday through Saturday, we live the way we want to live. Right? Yeah. So which of these three false gods are most attractive to you that you go towards? Cause that's not the God, cause our God is constant. Yeah. You know, he's constant and never changes. So it was just interesting. So a lot of us use the genie in the bottle. I know I have. I mean, I've been guilty of that, of genie in the bottle. Um, well, I think it's where a lot of Christians are. God, mm -hmm. help me. God, do this. God, give me that, you know. And, and actually, if you really want to learn or understand how to really pray well, go back in the Old Testament in Isaiah. There's a prayer from Hezekiah. He's praying because the Assyrians have... have uh, surrounded uh, Jerusalem and they, they're going to, they have, they have them in siege for a long time. And they're telling them they're going to wipe them out. They're going to kill them. They're just like the rest of the world. They're just, they're going to torture them. We're going to rape your women. We're just going to do all these things. They give them a letter saying all this stuff. And what's really cool is Isaiah goes to the temple, takes that letter, lays it on the altar, almost to say, Hey God, this is for you. You know, it's really cool. Then he prays. And this prayer doesn't start off with God help us. Mm 
Mm-hmm. It's God, you are amazing. You are magnificent. You are the ruler of all. I mean, he just tickles his ear, tells him how wonderful he is. Mm-hmm. He goes into all that. And at the very end, he says, oh, yeah, by the way, we've got this guy out here mm-hmm. who just wants to just ridicule you and say you're nothing and this and this and that, and et cetera, et cetera. And by, you know, show the world that you are the one and only God and take care of him. Yeah. And God killed the whole army. <laughs> you know? So, but it, but he he did it after he prayed all this stuff about recognizing in in adoration who God is. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah, and that's a hard thing to do because we do. I mean, we're all guilty of that. Yeah. You know, like, can you give me this? Can you give me that? Can this work out the way I want it to work out? And um, I've I've been in AA for almost a year now, and um, just learning like through that process of like the prayer of it's your will, not mine. So every morning, every night, it's the prayer that I pray because I've not been really good at controlling my own life and controlling things. And so giving it over every day and saying, um, what is ever your will? I want my will to align with what you have for me. And I want my life to align with what you have. And so whatever you decide to do with this, I'm okay with it. Well, it's well what, with my soul. That's what worship is. Yeah. I mean, you have it right there. Worship, because we all think worship is out singing songs in mm-hmm. church. No. Worship is the surrendering and the giving of your life to Him as a gift. Mm-hmm. God, here I am. I am yours. I give myself to you mm-hmm. to do as you please for me to do and be and become. Yeah. And that is worship. Yeah. And that's what we're supposed to do every single day. Yeah, it's very true. I'm, I'm, one of the things I realized is that even though I've been a Christian since birth, you know, I was raised in the church and, um, and I got saved when I was 12. And, you know, I, uh, we make other things our, our gods. You know, whatever it is that we go to when we're happy or when we're sad, that becomes our God instead of actually going to God and doing that. Yeah. And so for me, it was like a, a pivot shift in my life. And so it's been, it's been fantastic. Yeah. Good. I should probably go back to your questions. <laughs> uh, okay. So um, thinking about this. So this is from Ethiopia. I find it hard to forgive many times. We are told to forgive and forget. And if we don't forget, then we do not really have forgiveness in our heart. Please help me to understand. I want to be a forgiving person, and I want God to forgive me. This is such a hard topic. Let's pass. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I, you're, I, he's <laughs> passing on your question. Maybe next time. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I say this is a hard topic is because there's a lot of views out there that teach forgiveness, and they're they're only hitting the surface of the issue. Mm -hmm. Um, And people teach like, well, you know, because God says he remembers your sin no more from the east is from the to the west, that people are interpreting that as if he forgets, he forgot you even sinned. Well, that's not true. And that's not what the Hebrew means from that. What it means is that he remembers it no more. Mm -hmm. He doesn't, in other words, he doesn't hold it accountable to you is what it actually means. And what we need to learn about forgiveness, I think, are twofold. Number one, when we forgive somebody, it's about not holding the person accountable any longer. That's what forgiveness is. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's not forgetting that somebody did something. Because how can you learn? When we don't hold somebody accountable, we're, we're digesting the situation and what happened, what part they had in what you're doing and you did and so forth. Put it together and you just... Don't hold them accountable. That's forgiving. However, um, I and my teaching is, is very strong about becoming like Jesus. I mean, this is it. Beca- you know, making Jesus Lord of your life. When we become like Jesus, it changes our perception of what forgiveness is. Because Jesus is God. Okay, mm-hmm. He is holy. He is love. He is forgiveness. If Jesus is love and Jesus is forgiveness, as Jesus is joy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all these things that Jesus is, if we become like Jesus, we are literally becoming those things. 
We're not having to fight the acts of forgiveness any longer or the acts of love. I think forgiveness is actually part of love. But we are, we are dealing with the acts of because that's what's stressful. That's what's hard to do. Um, they did this to me. I said, I mean, it's so hard to forgive what they did. And we're thinking about the acts that people did rather than becoming that. Mm -hmm. And I think when we become like Jesus and Jesus is forgiveness, we're becoming forgiveness. So forgiveness at that point, beco point becomes second nature, like breathing air. You can't help breathe air unless somebody stops you from doing it. So as you breathe air, you forgive. So it becomes part of your makeup, it becomes part of you. It's like when Jesus told Peter, you know, when he said, how many times should I forgive? Seven times. No, 77 times. No, it doesn't mean 490 times is all you forgive. It means it's you just continually do it. And, and to understand that means that you become like him so that the qualities of the characteristics of God. Remember I said before, when God made, created us in his image, those things have, have blotted out. They've become tainted. Well, now they can become more in focus because they're really part of us. So our idea of forgiveness sometimes is, oh, I forgive you of this. And then you do it a second time. Well, I'm not going to forgive you now. You know, you take me for granted. So all of a sudden we're not really forgiving. So it's not about that. Mm -hmm. It's about becoming forgiveness. Now, along with that, doesn't mean that if, that if somebody does you wrong, to forgive them means to jump in their life if they're harmful to you. Because that, I mean, I think you can forgive somebody and, and not have them hurt you any longer. I know there are people who are living in abusive situations that I'll say, you need to forgive that person. You don't need to necessarily let them hurt you again. You don't need to be a part of your life. That's not what forgiveness is. Mm -hmm. But you don't need to hold them accountable. And you can, you can dismiss your life in that person's life because they'll hurt you. And that's what I think we're, what it's all about. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, I had a conversation with a friend about that piece of it. And I'm glad you said the boundaries because at what line does it become forgiving and then also <clears throat> you become, what do they call a doormat, right? You don't, did, God didn't call us to be doormats, right? Um, and forgiving too, like if you forgive that, what you said, well, you did it to me again. You forgave them with the expectation that they're going to change. And that's for God to do. It's not for us right. to do, right, to change. That's and a good so, point. Yeah. And so it's like just saying, I'm, I'm not going to hold you accountable. Well, that's a good question. So what is the difference between like being that forgiving and then not being a doormat? See, I've never been a doormat. So it really, <laughs> it's really hard for me. But, you know, but I married somebody who is a doormat to a lot of people. Yeah. And so she struggles with that. Um, she allows people to walk all over them. And I'm just like, no, you can't do this. You know, her own, even in her own family, mm -hmm. it's really frustrating for me because I, you need to stand up for yourself. You can't be just continually, you know, allowing people to hurt you. I mm -hmm. mean, but you know, you don't have to be hurtful back, but you have to learn what is appropriate. So, so it has you know, to do with like protecting your heart, guarding your heart. You know, there, that book, Boundaries, is really good. Um, if you've read it, uh, it's a really good book. But I, I think that what we need to, to understand, those of you who have never or may never read this book, it's important that we need to have boundaries. We set boundaries. It's, it's okay to say no to people. In fact, sometimes it's preferable to say no to people. Um, and I think it's important that we understand that God wants to live a life that's fruitful and blessing him. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, I came to give you life and give you more abundantly. In other words, complete. If he came to give us a complete life and all we're doing is laying down for people to walk all over us, then we're not living that abundant, complete life. Mm -hmm. So we need to really evaluate that. What helps me live an abundant life that honors Jesus in my life and for others? It's okay to say no to people. It's okay to say, you know, I, I just can't do that. You don't have to hurt people. No, I, I, you don't need to be mean or nasty to people so you don't become a doormat. That's wrong too. Mm -hmm. You need to learn that balance of what it is to be like Jesus. You know, um, I think it's really important.
Good. That's a great question, actually. Uh, okay, so this one is from the United States as well. Uh, I was saved many years ago in the church when I prayed the prayer of salvation. I recently met a girl I really like, and she claims to be a Christian. But she told me that she never prayed such a prayer and that she has always known Jesus as her Lord and Savior. Since I do not want to be unequally yoked, would I consider her saved or not? She was really liked, huh? I like the way you put the emphasis on really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I make it dramatic. Dun, dun, dun. You know, this has come up a lot in in my ministry. I, I, I used to, when I was a pastor for teenagers or for young adults, this would always come up, you know, um, First off, let's, let's back up. We need to understand that we cannot put ourselves on a throne of judgment to say that I'm like God. I can, I can tell whether you're going to heaven or not. We can't do that. If we're doing that, you're in sin. Mm -hmm. You're taking God's place, and that's not a good thing. We can't do that. However, on the other side of the coin, we need to also remember that the sinner's prayer, the pray to become a Christian, is not something that's in the Bible. It never says in the Bible that we need to say a sinner's prayer or say a prayer to become a Christian. Never, ever, ever. And the church of today, they almost live on that. They really do. You know, more and more churches are like at the end of a service, pray this prayer so you can become a Christian. And, and it's like, where do they get that? Well, you know, Romans 10, 9. No, that doesn't even equate to the same thing. It doesn't mean that at all. Mm -hmm. So we have this misconception that if I pray the prayer, I'm a Christian. If you don't, you're not. Mm -hmm. Because you have to say the prayer in order to be a believer. And that's false. There are many people, especially in, in the Catholic Church, and probably even in, in the Orthodox Church, that believe that Jesus is the Lord of their life and they follow him. Guess what? They're a believer. They're a Christian. Mm -hmm. Even though they never said this prayer. The prayer is only a 200-year-old prayer. It, 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 evolved, it evolved out of the uh, great revival. Mm -hmm. So it's not even that old. So you think about it. If that was the, the deciding factor, whether you're a Christian or not, that means from the time of Jesus to the time of the 1750 or whatever it was, all those people died because they didn't have a prayer. I mean, that's kind of hideous. It's not about a prayer. Is Jesus the Lord of her life? Is Jesus the Lord of your life? You know, if, if you say you prayed a prayer, so now the question is, is Jesus the Lord of your life? Because I know a lot of people have prayed the prayer, think they're going to heaven because they prayed the prayer, but Jesus is nowhere near the Lord of their life. Mm -hmm. But Jesus says, I mean, the Bible says, if you want to be saved, call on the name of the Lord Jesus. I mean, become his servant. He needs to become your master. That is what the Bible teaches. So if you have Jesus as the Lord of your life, regardless of whether you've prayed this prayer or not, you're a believer in Jesus. Follow his teachings. You're a believer in Jesus. If you prayed the prayer and never follow him, you're not a believer in Jesus. You're not a Christian. You're only a Christian in word not in actual life. And I think that's that's been a really disaster what's happening to the church we have today in Christendom. Mm -hmm. It's really tearing down our church. That's one of the, there's a lot of factors that have been hurting our church and that's one of them. And I think that we need to recognize this, that it's not about a prayer, it's about the change of heart, the change of life, the following Jesus. It's being born of from above, born of God. Mm -hmm. And when you're born of God, you become a new creation, a new creature. Something powerful happens within you to become like him, to follow him. That is a Christian. So if, if you're thinking you're worried about a prayer, forget the prayer. Go back to, is Jesus Lord of your life? Is he Lord of her life? And if she's saying he's Lord of his, her life, then is she following the teachings of Jesus? If she is, well, there you go. The Bible says you'll know him by their fruits. Case closed. Yeah, very true. It's a discussion that comes up with my, <laughs> I thought it was in college, you know, with um, 
gentlemen who say that they are, but then their actions don't match up with that. Yeah. Right? And so she's been very discerning in that piece. Like they're not, you know, they don't match up to where I'm at. And so when they're there, they can ask me out. But until then, I'm not going out with it. Which well, I'm yeah. Like, okay. And and the unequally yoked, you know, it's interesting because uh, I know a lot of people, <laughs> girls are really, you know, and I'm not trying to be sexist, but they really are the, the worst part of this. They try to date a guy because they like him. He's cute. He's nice. All this kind of stuff. And they'll date him, even though he's not a Christian, to think that, well, maybe I can witness to him so he'll become a Christian, <laughs> you know. And then next thing you know, they get married or she gets pregnant or something happens that... I wish I could refute that. I can't. <laughs> I mean, it's just so... Yeah. I mean, I've yeah. worked with hundreds of teenagers, I mean, for yeah. years and years and college students. And I've seen it happen time and time again. And, uh, and a lot of these guys take advantage of these girls. And, and it's really bad. So I really believe we need to understand what equal, unequally yoked means. It's from the get-go. <laughs> Not that, oh, I hope one day if we get serious, because it's going to get serious before you realize. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And you end up hurting your own self. Exactly. Instead of guarding your heart, which... Yeah. You know. And part of being un, unequally yoked isn't only with the marriage partner. What about your friends? Mm. You know, are your closest friends those who are believers? Or do you hang out with all kinds of sinners and go to church on Sunday or Saturday and, hey, that's good? No. You know, be unequally yoked refers to all of your relationships. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. That goes into that that, um, that part, too, of, so, if you have friends who are not saved, right? So, you, I hope I, um, I want to say this right. I don't want to say this wrong. I probably will say it wrong anyways. Um, I'm known for inserting foot and mouth. But so you, if you're a Christian and you have friends, do you only have friends who are saved or can there be people in your life who are not saved? All right. So I have friends who are not saved, mm -hmm. who are not Christians. I have family members who are not Christians. You know, do I see them and do things with them? Absolutely. However, the people I do the more intimate things with, that I share my heart with, that I say things, talk to, uh, that I want prayer for, and so forth. The things I do with somebody that I'm closest to are all believers. Mm -hmm. It's outside that circle of that closeness. Those others are more, they're friends, but they're more acquaintance type friends. Mm -hmm. That there are things I won't share with them because there's things I you know, I would not want to share certain things to unbelievers. Mm -hmm. Now, I have friends with them. They know I'm a believer. They know that I honor Jesus and I live for him. And I try very much to make my life reflect that to them so that they'll see Jesus in me. Mm -hmm. And in that, hopefully, they'll come around one day and say, you know what, I need to talk or you know what, I need to do, have what you have or whatever it is so that my life becomes a witness to them. Understand, Jesus ate and drank with sinners. Mm -hmm. It says it all through the scriptures. He ate and drank with them. But he didn't do it, do it to hang out with them. He did it to be a witness to, with them. He did it to show them what it was supposed to be like to honor God, to serve the Father. That was his reasoning. So, But the ones he was close with and shared the intimate things with were his disciples. His 12. Even in his 12, he had three. Apart from that, he shared even more intimate things with. Mm -hmm. So I think that's how that would answer that. Yeah, I, I love that too. I recently had a, some friends or a couple of friends that said they weren't, they're not believers, but they're like, we watch, there's three of us in our little, in this group. Like we watch how you guys interact and how you live your life. And that's attractive to us, like to be a Christian because we've been turned off by other things, right, that the church has been known, you know, been known for. Um, and so it's really good because it's some of the prayers that we do is like when people see me, let them see you through me. And that one, you know, let your light shine through so that it draws people closer. Um, and I love that. So I love your answer. Your friends who are not believers are going to watch you like a hawk. Oh, and that's okay. 
But they, but that's the thing is yeah. they want to watch you and they're going to watch you. And, and when you, if you decide to live like a sinner, they're going to, aha, I knew it was fake. See, that's what's going to happen. But yeah. if you hold strong and you're honoring Jesus all the way through, make a mistake's not a big deal mm -hmm. because you're making a mistake. They'll see that and they'll say, there's something real about you. So it, it, that's where we're at. And yeah. we, we are, we are like a, a Bible. We are like Jesus to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much so. And, you know, you do make mistakes, and I think it's important to say, you're right, I do. I make mistakes. I'm accountable for that. Yeah. And this is how I've chosen to live my life, and this is what I do. Yeah. So it's good. Okay. So when we are saved, this is from Moldova. So when we are saved, what are we saved from? Okay. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> You know, and I can give the classic, oh, we're saved from sin, you know, or we're saved from hell. But I think there's much more. I wrote I wrote a paper one time on, on salvation, and I taught a class on this, um, at the class I just have now, that we're so bogged down with being saved from sin or saved from hell. And I, I think, I mean, that's that's typical. And those are typical answers. Those are not wrong. Those are correct answers. But I think we need to look at it differently. What are we saved for? I think too often we think about what we're saved from and we don't think about what we're saved for. And I think what we're saved for is unto life. Mm -hmm. we're, we're saved for eternity. We're saved for a lifetime and an eternity with Jesus, with God. And when we see that, what we're saved from almost takes a total back seat somewhere because we're looking at what we're saved for. And um, yeah, I, I don't know else how to say it, but. That's beautiful. Um, that switches my mind because it, it makes you think of like the fear base, like we get into fear base. And so, I mean, we have a healthy fear of God like that, that piece. But we, when you say saved from what we're, doing then is not mainly to watch or to walk with Jesus. It's so we don't burn in hell, right? right. When you're saying safe from, when you say safe for, I love that. It makes it seem very special. I think we need to grow out of the idea we're saving from hell so we don't burn. We, ha we want fire insurance. Mm -hmm. What we need to look at it is how, what we're saved for because we want to fall in love with Jesus. Mm -hmm. We want to f become like him and know him. And in doing that, we're saved for him. We're, we're, it's a whole different mentality it's it's what i would say coming from milk getting to meat mm -hmm. like paul says i think it's a whole different focus we're all a lot of us are down here what we're safe from but few people understand no we're safe for life we're safe for him we're safe for eternity we're safe for that relationship that he created us for that's beautiful um so and this is from russia does the bible teach that we are saved by grace alone no <laughs> Boy, you know, I have heard that so much lately. I have read that on, online so much. Oh, we're all, we're all saved by grace alone. That's so false. Read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. We are saved by grace through faith. In the Old Testament, it's all about faith. In the New Testament, it's all about faith. We're saved through our faith walking with him, becoming like him. God gives us grace. I mean, he gives us grace. But the salvation comes because of our faith in him, because we believe unto salvation, unto eternity, and follow him because of that. And we, we follow his teachings. We become like that. And, and that's where we're saved, uh, where, where it's all about. It, grace is just something that God grants us because he's that way. That's part of his attributes. But our salvation comes from our faith. It's our doing. God doesn't. God has made the plan for us to be saved. But we have to take the initiative to turn to him and follow him if we really want salvation. It's not because he just gave us grace. It's because we turned with our faith and, and followed him. That's that's huge. And I know that that say through saved by grace is, is huge right now. And it's I'm hearing it and seeing it all over, you know, but it's it's really it's incomplete. 
It's watered down Christianity. I would say that. I don't want to minimize God's grace. It's huge. But you, you can't eliminate faith. You can't eliminate pistuo, belief. You, got, you can't eliminate that. If you do, you've taken out the whole, whole plan and process of God's salvation. Good. I think we have time for one last question. Okay. This is from Texas. Not from the United States, from Texas. <laughs> <laughs> is it biblical and godly to love oneself? If you consider the scripture describing love in Corinthians 13, it seems that this love is what we should exhibit. If you consider what Jesus said to love your neighbor as yourself, he is prescribing that we do to our neighbor as we would to ourselves. My point is that I have heard various opinions that you are not to love yourself because it might lead to conceit and egotism. Hmm. Okay, that's probably a pastor preaching that one, uh, but it's probably not a pastor asking the question. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, I've heard that too. I, I've heard that. Yeah, years and years ago, I think I've heard something like that. Um, I just can't place it. But in 1 Corinthians, what, what's really amazing is that when we look at the word love, you know, we have to go back to the Greek. We just really have to because the word that's translated to the word love is agape or agapeo, okay? And when we look at that, what does agape mean? It means something we, we give of ourselves to someone else. We, we dedicate ourselves to someone else. We lay down our life for someone else. We, we give without the expectation of anything in return. So in the King James Version, it doesn't use the word love. It uses the word charity, which is actually more accurate than the word love, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Because agape is all about charity. It's all about the giving of yourself. So when we talk about the giving of ourself, that's what we're talking about when we talk about love. Unfortunately, this person from Texas is looking at the word love as we think it today. You know, mm -hmm. love, 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 you know, all this stuff and feelings and emotions and stuff that, you know, I do for you because I want to. And and really what agape is, is I, I give to you because it's just the right thing to do, not mm -hmm. because you feel like it or you want to. It's just the right thing to do. And and uh, by doing that, you've actually uh, sufficed or you made what love is by giving of yourself. So when we love others as we love ourselves, the way we give of ourselves, give to ourselves, is the way we need to give to others. So it all works the same, but it's not about the selfish and um, egotistical or you know puffed up way we are, because that's not love. That's just narcissist. That's just stuff that you know that's not part of God. Mm -hmm. So I would say you've got the words confused of what love is when you're thinking that part of it. Our ego is not part of love. It's just part of our selfishness. But our giving to one another, our giving to ourselves, the giving of to God, because the first commandment says, you know, it talks about that in, in Matthew, is that we give of ourselves. We love God with all of our being, okay? And the second is like the first, to give love to our neighbor as ourself. So it's like the same thing. We give of ourselves, and that's a huge part of what love is, not the idea that, I think highly or do highly because I'm so wonderful, you're so wonderful. That's not, or, you know, I'm, you know, that egotistical thing they're thinking of is not part of love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Well, I think. We're done. We're done. Yeah. <laughs> we still have lots of questions, but I appreciate um, the questions that have been brought forward and your responses to it. I always have a great time when I'm here with you and uh -huh. I learn a lot. I love it when you come here. You're, you're, <laughs> you, you need to come all the time. <laughs> so, uh, well, we have our next one in December. I don't know when, but we'll have it in okay. December. You'll so. just have to let me know. Yeah. We'll work it out. Get your schedule here. <laughs> well, I want to thank everybody for joining us. This has been truly wonderful. If you have any comments or any questions on these uh these particular questions, please please comment on them or ask them. I want to let you know that we had a we had a program. I think it was two weeks ago with Dallas Home. We had one of our largest viewership, over twenty thousand. I think it was. It was pretty cool. 
So, uh, and a lot of comments, about 30 or so comments. So it's been really nice. Uh, we're, we're growing and uh, hopefully we're reaching you and, and sharing the word with you and, and you're enjoying everything we're doing here. So I want to tell everybody and I offer you aloha and you have a wonderful week. Thank you.